We are looking at Derek Parfit's response to this interesting question of why does the universe exist? And as we look at the question, we recognize that there are actually two questions of concern. One is, why is there a universe at all? Right? Why is there something rather than nothing? So that's an interesting question to explore. The second question is more narrow in its focus. And that is, why does the universe have the features that it does? And this second question is the one that is really driving Parfit's uh, response. And it's the one that he's exploring more thoroughly. Now, he suggests right off the bat that there really can't be a causal explanation for the existence of the universe because no law of nature could explain why there are laws of nature, right? So you can't have a causal explanation for the universe because you need to have laws of nature in order to have a causal explanation, and that's just not possible. Now, Parfit does uh, consider this possibility, even if God created the world, he says, that does not explain what caused God to exist. Now, I can't help but comment on this uh, from my own perspective. This seems to be a misunderstanding of the theological doctrine that God is uncaused. God is a self-existent necessary being. So by the nature of God, you cannot have a cause for God existing. So the question seems to be vacuous in that sense. It's somewhat similar to a person who first sees a car in the late 1800s. And uh, prior to that, every vehicle that he's ever seen that's moving is driven by either a person or a horse, most commonly, or an ox or something like that. And so they see the car and they ask where the horse is, right? And they talk about the internal combustion engine, try to explain it to the person. And he's still looking for a, a horse or a little sheep or something that's because every vehicle requires an animal to drive it. That's the presumption. Now, there is something odd about our universe. Our current physics tells us that there's something odd about our universe. And so here he's certainly agreeing with those who present fine-tuning arguments for the existence of God. So he says, clearly the parameters of the initial condition of the Big Bang had to be within an extremely limited range in order for our universe to exist. And that just comes from the most recent physics that we have starting in the mid to late 20th century and continuing into contemporary physics now. The odds of the right parameters, that is parameters that would lead to life and intelligent beings, are something less than one in a billion billion. Now, some people have suggested it's even a lot less than that, uh, because when you take into consideration all the various factors like the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the strong nuclear force, the the charge of electrons, the mass of electrons, the list goes on and on. The odds seem to be, uh, all of those have to be set in very narrow parameters in order to get a universe where there can be living organisms and rational beings like us. So the odds seem to be similar to winning a jackpot, jackpot in the Powerball lottery dozens of times in a row with buying only one ticket each time it just requires an explanation. It's not something that you would just accept. Now, Parfit says there is a mistaken response. So he has the insight that I certainly agree with here. It would be mistaken simply to say, well, some universe or another had to exist. So why not a universe like ours? And of course, we're here asking this question. So it had to be a 
we had to be in a universe that allows life. Now, this is a very common response. Parfit says it's mistaken because it might be true that we couldn't ask about our universe if a universe like this did not exist. But the question of why our universe exists continues. So it's comparable to surviving a horrible crash where the odds are just absolutely against you, but you survive. And so you're there and you ask the question, how is it that I survived? That is a reasonable question to ask. And it demands an explanation. So there must be some guiding principles to tell when something is not by chance. Now, I've explored this in, in, a, in an article elsewhere, but let's focus in what Parfit, on what Parfit has to say. He says, we can use some guidelines to tell us when something is created intentionally. The SETI Institute does this, for example, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, they are looking across the universe to see if there are other intelligent beings out there. So what would they need to find? Well, they have, they've just found random radio signals and, and natural things that can be easily explained. What would be hard to explain? Well, what if they found a radio pulse with the first 1,000 digits of pi? Now, if they found that and then it repeated again and again, that would be clearly something that we would say there's an intelligence behind it. So Parfit suggests you could compare this to two different situations of winning a lottery. In one lottery, there had to be a winner. So uh, like Powerball lotteries, eventually there has to be a winner. So the person might ask, why me? But that there was a winner is not surprising. Versus a different kind of lottery where it was a one-time thing and it, there doesn't have to be a winner. In fact, the odds on there being a winner is extremely, exceedingly unlikely. So for example, being saved from an execution in which is, it was extremely unlikely that that would happen. So our universe, says Parfit, is like the latter case. It requires an explanation. So the basis for his search for an explanation is found. And Parfit says there are two prominent answers that might have explanatory value, but he prefers a third one that he developed. So let's explore the potential examples uh, explanations, that is. So the first one would be something like this. Our universe is actually one of many, many universes. So things are actually like the former lottery. After so many universes, it's expected that you get one that's capable of supporting life. And our universe is one of many, many worlds that exists. And so it's not that strange, it's not that surprising that we would be in a universe like this, like ours. And so we don't really need an explanation after all. So the explanation of why we don't need an explanation is a legitimate response. Now there's a problem with this, says Parfit. The problem is there isn't any evidence for these other worlds, despite what physicists like to claim Sometimes they have not found evidence for these other worlds. And the, the best reason to hypothesize, to be thinking about these other worlds uh, and to suppose that they might exist is in order to explain the fine tuning. So how do you explain the fine tuning? Well, you hypothesize if there were many, many universes that would explain it. But that response is, is ad hoc. It's just... It's just throwing out something for which we have no evidence. Um, so Parfit is not satisfied with that explanation. So he considers a potential explanation uh, number two. So the idea here is one that's been around, of course, for millennia. And the idea is that God created our universe 
in a way that allowed for life to emerge. So this explanation has the advantage of it not being surprising that God would want to make a universe with life possible, and in particular, intelligent, rational life possible. But Parfit says there's a problem with this explanation. And the main problem with this hypothesis is that God created our that our, that God created our world. The main problem with that hypothesis is the problem of evil. And he says there's just too much point with suffering in this world if God, as traditionally conceived, created it. Now Parfit considers this as conclusive, uh, but of course, you know, he doesn't argue as such. That would take uh, a much more work in order to do so. And certainly the literature on the problem of evil is very, very extensive, both uh, for people who take Parfit's view and for theists who are responding to the problem. So what is the third explanation, the one that Parfit actually prefers? It is the axiarchic view. Axiarchic view is, uh, axiarch uh, is a term related to value. So the idea here is, it would be best if re reality were a certain way. There's value in having a world that exists that is the way that this world exists. And so in fact, reality is that way. And then Parfit says, first principle explains why reality is that way. Reality is this way because it would be best if reality were this way. So of all the ways for things to be, one's the best, and that's the way things are. Now, he acknowledges right off the bat, but with a little twist, that this could take a theistic form or a naturalistic form. So this could be because God is causing this, or it could be a naturalistic form where he says that there's just this axiarchic principle, and so the best is manifest, to use a contemporary term. Parfit argues against the theistic view for reasons we've seen above, and also because he says the inclusion of God is redundant. You don't need to include God in order to make the axiarchic view work. And so you should just stick with the naturalistic form. So what are the credible selectors? Uh, you know, the, the axiarchic view is one. There are others. Uh, there, there might be or could have been other credible selectors. That is uh, a, a value of force. I'm not sure he wants to use the word force. Um, that could be used to explain why we have a universe that is like ours, um, the best, having the best universe, that's what he's going with, or maybe having the simplest universe or the least arbitrary universe or as full and varied as possible kind of universe or the most elegant universe. And, you know, but possibly somebody might say, uh, maybe the existence of our world is random. It's just a brute fact. And there is no explanation of its existence. Now, Parfit says there, there's a problem with taking this path. The problem with the brute fact view is the existence of life that has value that makes our kind of universe utterly distinct from other types of universe universes that would be much more probable. Okay, so what kind of questions might be raised for the axiarchic view of Parfit? He, he certainly agrees that on his view, it's reasonable to ask a few questions. One might be, how many worlds is it good to have? Right, so we know of ours. Wouldn't it be good to have others like ours? Mm, maybe. Um, is there a cutoff point? Is our world just above the cutoff point, which might provide some more explanations of things we would like to explain? 
So for example, maybe all the good worlds exist and ours is a good world, but ours is one of those good worlds, but you know, it's it's just above the, the cutoff level, but there are many other worlds that are better than ours. Now, actually, Timothy O'Connor, who's a theist, argues for a view like this, but in the context of God creating worlds, that God actually created many, many worlds, and our world has a lot of problems with it, but it is overall of value to have a world like ours. But there might be other worlds that are even better than ours. Well, that's uh, not a widely held view, but it is a view like Parfit suggests. Now, there is a seemingly a non-theistic problem of evil, a, a naturalistic problem of evil for the axiarchic view. And it's because, you know, if we have a world like this, that means, you know, it's good to have a world like this, but our world has all this evil in it. And again, uh, Parfit's response is, well, maybe we're above that cutoff line. And maybe our world is like a lesser painting in a museum. So the idea is that our world could have been better, but the universe as a whole, or and we might say universes, collection of universes as a whole, is better with the existence of our world. And uh, we certainly wouldn't want a museum where every single painting is the Mona Lisa or a replica of the Mona Lisa. That is not an interesting museum. So this gives some motivation for the idea that, you know, you can explain why there's evil in our world, even though it's a natural world. And of course, that is the path that O'Connor takes for the theistic perspective. Now, implications. Even on the axiarchic view, it might make sense that all possible worlds exist because existence is a good thing. Or it might make sense to say that it would be best that no world exists. So there would be no evil. Now, Parfit argued that the axiarchic view is to be favored over the hypothesis that God exists and created the universe, because that just takes one step further than is possible on the suggestion that God exists. In other words, the axiarchic view, even if it takes a theistic turn, it's because uh, it would be good that God exists and then God create these worlds. Uh, so, you know, possibly you could be a theist and agree with much of what Parfit has to say. But then again, um, he would prefer that it's, you. why bother, right? It would be simpler if God didn't exist. So it's, it's preferred and more plausible that we just have the Arxiac axiarchic view that is naturalistic, not one that is theistic. Let's think a little bit more about brute facts. Even if one of his suggested selectors is correct, like the axiarchic view, he could ask why that one is the correct answer. Why not the simplest one? Or why not the most elegant world? And in fact, Parfit initially accepted the axiarchic view as the final answer, but later after the, the article that I'm using for this, he qualified that maybe this can't be the ultimate explanation after all. Uh, why the axiarchic view is the selector seems to be a brute fact, but kind of doesn't want it to be the brute fact. Uh, but overall, that's that's not so bad. Brute facts exist, and that we just have to deal with them, and it could be a brute fact that the axiarchic view is correct, and that provides the explanation for why there is a universe like ours with intelligent beings that live in it. 